Welcome back as we continue our fourth annual conference, Biblical Identities in an Age of Wokeism and Transhumanism, sponsored by the Center for Apologetics and Worldviews and hosted at Bethany Lutheran College. The Center for Apologetics and Worldviews sponsors conferences, publications, and other opportunities to present evidence for the truth of Christianity, to critique worldviews that oppose Christianity, to fortify believers with a proper interpretation of Holy Scripture, and to engage unbelievers in conversations leading toward the gospel proclamation of forgiveness in Christ. For those attending in person, there is a packet of handouts available in the back. For those watching by live video stream now or by recording later, you can access a PDF of the same handouts at blc.edu slash apologetics slash events. Our primary aim for this year's conference is to examine what the voices in our culture are saying about human nature and to be ready to respond to the confusion and deception around us with clarity and truth from Holy Scripture. And our next speaker will address something that impacted millions, I think even billions of people, Christians in recent years. Do you recall where you were the morning of Easter in the year 2020? Very few went to church. Most churches were closed. Many churches offered online video streams instead. Was that a blessing? Enabling you to listen to God's word even though churches had been closed for fear of COVID-19 contagion? Or was it a mixed blessing? Beneficial in some ways, but also undermining some fundamental aspects of the divine service. Our next speaker will argue that an online divine service is theologically impossible, at least in the fullest sense of what the divine service ought to be. Yes, broadcasting a church service online can be a blessing, but it comes at a cost that must be reckoned with. What happens to the sacramental nature of the divine service? To be clear, our speaker does not have any knee-jerk animosity against technology. Rather, Joshua Pauling is a thoughtful Christian a devoted husband, a veteran public school teacher, a homeschool father, and someone who thinks carefully about how to apply the scriptures to everyday life. His essays have appeared in a variety of magazines. He's been interviewed for numerous radio shows, and he's here to talk with us today about the Trojan horse of online worship, how embodied souls receive sacramental blessings from the incarnate God. Please welcome Joshua Pauling. Thank you. It's such a privilege to be with you all. Thank you, Ryan, and everyone involved in the conference. It's been so encouraging and inspiring to, uh, to see Bethany Lutheran and the ELS and the work that you all are involved in. Uh, so keep up the good work. I always enjoy my trips to the Midwest. Um, my wife's from Indiana, and I grew up in the Northeast, so anytime I can get back to a place where I can take my, my shoes off in the grass and walk around on nice soft grass with no fire ants, um, I always enjoy that because I live in the South now, so it's, it's nice to see some, some real grass on the ground again. So just as we're going, uh, sort of a, just something to get started with, I refer you to our handout to follow along. Um, I've got an outline to help you track. Please feel free to jot down anything you want to discuss during the Q&A. Um, and then also at the top there, I've got my contact info and my writing portfolio if you want to continue the discussions afterward. Love to do that. I'm sure there'll be some things you uh, agree with and disagree with in my session and look forward to the question and answers to engage with you about those things. And that's how we learn from each other, right? I wouldn't have it any other way. So let's get into it. After a, fruitful, after a fruitless and legendary 10-year siege of Troy that we call the Trojan War, the great Greek warrior Odysseus, the trickster more cunning than any of the Greek heroes, proposed a bold and risky move to put an end to the war. At Odysseus' bidding, the Greeks would construct a huge wooden horse to be presented as a gift to the city of Troy while pretending to sail away from the city, signaling a supposed end to the war. Yet hidden within the horse's belly was an elite fighting force. It was time for black ops, Greek style. As the Greeks pretended to sail away, the Trojans, despite the warnings of Cassandra, pulled the large wooden horse into their city as a victory trophy. 
That night, the Greek warriors inside the horse snuck out and then opened the city gates for the rest of the Greek army, which had sailed back under the cover of darkness. They walked right in. Troy was destroyed, and the Greeks victorious, all because the Trojans had brought into their midst something that would ultimately cause their own downfall. This story of the Trojan horse has become a rich and multi-layered metaphor, commonly used to refer to everything from computer viruses to historical subversions introduced from the outside, but welcomed in by the very people that ended up being destroyed. I would suggest that this is also clearly on display in the church's relationship to digital technology. Have we, too, welcomed in the tools of our own demise and destruction? Has the use of digital technology to facilitate online worship actually undercut the very foundations of our theology and understanding of what worship actually is? Has online worship unintentionally communicated a mind-body dualism that runs counter to Christianity's holistic view of the human person. Can the full reality of Christian worship be neatly captured and curated in an online stream or digital download? What do these formats communicate about the nature of the church service? And if you can really do church online, why ever return? These are hard questions that cause us to revisit and rethink our own practices and those of our churches. This is hard, but necessary. We could certainly list a long list of potential uses or abuses, pros and cons of online worship. But I fear that such a pragmatic and utilitarian approach frequently misses the deeper philosophical and theological issues at work. So, too, we could find many special cases and scenarios where providing online worship for a homebound member or a hospitalized parishioner seems to be the best solution. But as the saying goes, hard cases make bad law. There are countless what-if scenarios that would need to be addressed with the utmost care and attention to both the person's needs and the theology being communicated by the proposed solutions. We've all faced many of these scenarios the past few years, and we will continue to. In this session, we will consider our overall approach to digital technology in the church and what our practices communicate theologically. First, by way of introduction, we'll see how questions of constructed identity and neo-Gnosticism are very much connected to questions of online worship. Then we'll explore two main lines of argument. The first line of argument will focus in on the nature of the human person and the primacy of the body in human experience, a proper theology of the body, if you will. The second line of argument will focus in on the nature of the church and the primacy of God's work through means of grace, which require bodily participation, water, word, bread, wine, tangible, visible, messy things that God has promised to give himself through. And throughout, we will consider some of the practical implications. Now, as demonstrated in Brandon's prior session, no space today seems safe from the colonizing forces of digital technology as the seemingly inevitable march of technological progress continues. We find ourselves at the gateway to transhumanism's vision, the seamless blending of the human and the digital, with its alluring promises of increased intelligence, longer life expectancy, and ease of living. And pandemic living has further expanded the role of the ubiquitous screen. It is essential to recapture the real and carve out sanctified spaces of peace and refuge from the mesmerizing pull of screens and digital technologies. And this starts by first realizing that technology is never neutral. It brings with it a world picture. If you go to the forest with an axe on your shoulder, you would view the forest and your relation to it in one way. It takes labor, sweat, and a long time to chop down one big oak tree. But go to the forest with a bulldozer and a logging truck, and the view is quite another. 
The technologies that surround us push us towards certain perspectives about the world and about ourselves. Now, as the Industrial Revolution unfolded over the past few centuries, we gained astounding capabilities to produce and distribute resources at scales previously unimaginable. We're thankful to God for the many blessings it brings. But we also should acknowledge that it impacts how we view the world and ourselves. 20th century technologies allowed us to commodify nature, and we ended up commodifying ourselves. Where humans, too, are seen as what philosopher Martin Heidegger called standing reserve, or as we might say, products on the shelf, inventory. Now, as we are living through a digital revolution, the stakes are raised because digital technologies tend towards disembodiment more easily than the industrial, agricultural, and transportation technologies of the past few centuries. Those still at least required in some way bodily action in conjunction with them. Such mechanical and analog technologies were handled, repaired, seen, and understood. Digital technologies, however, are in large part hidden, invisible, non-real, mystifying, and are reprogramming us, yet we fail to grasp the radical paradigm shift that is underway. As the late 20th century Canadian philosopher George Grant put it, technology is the ontology of our age. That is to say, the way we understand our very being has been so intertwined and connected to the technological mechanisms and devices through which we experience and interact with the world that it becomes the framework for our overall take on reality as a whole, our basic worldview. The essence of the human being is no longer one of creatureliness or givenness or thrownness, to use another term from Heidegger, but one of will, self-expression, and power, choice, autonomy, and control where we can bend human reality to our own will as stuff to be manipulated, manufactured, into the final product of our own choosing. Samuel James summarizes this well when he writes, quote, The Internet is not a singular tool or hobby. It is an immersive, epistemological habitat. An immersive, epistemological habitat in which hundreds of millions of people have regular, active membership. All of us. The internet has transformed the way humans read, learn, communicate, labor, shop, recreate, and even worship, he says. No other technology is as disruptive to traditional forms of human activity. And then comes James' most pungent point. Christians may be good at critiquing the content of the internet, porn, social media, etc., but we've not thought as closely about the form of the internet and what that does to us. Which is to say, we need to understand that online technologies are not only potential sources of illicit content or sinful temptation. The very form of the digital medium and its networking effects are powerful instruments of personal formation that push us in a certain spiritual and epistemological direction. The digital ecosystem we find ourselves in today pushes us towards understanding identity as internally constructed and self-chosen. In this era of the digitized self, identity can be tweaked and tailored, curated and performed in ways previously unimagined. The new book Gen Z Explained, The Art of Living in a Digital Age, calls these fine-grained identities, in which separate conflicting identity strands are held together digitally. Such carefully crafted, fine-grained identities can be tried on or remade at will online. They're always a work of ongoing discovery, always becoming, never being, never stable or anchored to unchanging real things or transcendent truths. 
In such a world, reality is just raw material to be manipulated as one chooses, not something imbued with deep meaning. The locus of meaning and truth has shifted from the external world to the internal self of mind and feeling. Contributing to this fact is the reality that screens tend to function more like mirrors to the self than windows to the world. They put us on the never-ending cycle of self to exhibit, to perform, and advertise a version of ourselves in search of stronger dopamine hits of affirmation, likes, and shares, which only then quickly disappear or never materialize in the first place. In this sense, screens function much like religious objects of devotion. Heads are bowed to the almighty screen. The divinity behind the screen is consulted on every question, from weather to directions, from random trivia facts to finding Bible verses. As Byung-Chul Han writes, through the digital screen, we continue to go to confession. We expose ourselves voluntarily, yet we're no longer asking for forgiveness, but rather for attention, and I might add acceptance and affirmation. As digitalization continues, we are consuming and being consumed by both form and content that runs counter to truth, goodness, and beauty, and the central teachings of the Christian gospel, and the central role of the human body in how we experience the world. As Jamie Smith puts it in You Are What You Love, we as humans are not simply brains on a stick. We are embodied agents of desire and love. We are not just minds that happen to have bodies. Our bodies are not just temporary shells or accidental stuff that cover up the real you. Yet we're constantly being culturally catechized towards this dualistic and reductionistic picture of humanity. The person-body dualism or mind-body dualism so evident today usually flows from one of two places. One view treats us as if we're only thinking things, brains on a stick, calculating machines, cognitive devices, humans as flesh robots or meat computers. The other view treats us as if we're just feeling things, hearts on a stick, we might say, driven only by emotions or instincts, a bundle of desires to be expressed, highly evolved animals. The digital world funnels us towards either of these faulty views. Behind a screen, it's easy to just be a thinking thing, typing and sending messages, reading and listening, but all of it is done at a distance without your body actively engaged with the real world and real people. Behind a screen, it's also easy to be just the feeling thing, where anger and frustration, like and dislike, passion and desire can easily be expressed and are easily intensified with the push of a button or the swipe of a finger. In both trajectories, the brain on a stick or the heart on a stick, dualism reigns. The person and the body are separated, as the emotions or the mind are put above everything else. This is the Instagramified life, airbrushed and flawless, enhanced and edited, curated and staged, driven by head or by heart. You click, you get. You swipe, you see. The hard edges of reality are eased, softened, and distorted when mediated through a screen. Real human interaction is categorically different. There is friction, awkward silences, like that one, making eye contact, avoiding eye contact, uncomfortable moments, thinking of what to say, let alone confrontation with material stuff, gravel to skin your knee on, grass to walk on, steps you might trip over, people that are in your way. What makes digital technology so alluring is this removal of the friction of reality, which then draws us away from actual reality. In this increasing digitized environment, 
further mediated by additional technological layers, our capacity to flourish as human beings actually is diminished as we risk losing some of our natural abilities for learning about the world by directly acting upon it. Those skills atrophy, right? You see, we don't just have bodies, we are bodies. Our embodiment is not an accident. As bodily creatures, we have inbuilt limits that are purposeful and for our good. Our bodies bind us to one physical location at a time and place us within humanely scaled and manageable frameworks that guide us towards what we should attend to. Such guardrails actually make the world manageable and navigable, reminding us that the world is to be experienced directly with our bodies. Now, in support of this point, there's been some fascinating studies in the animal kingdom, especially of cats and rats, that show that animals that actively transport themselves and engage their environment directly with their bodies exhibited better health and cognition than those animals that were passively transported or carried. So basically, they set up these little experiments with cats and rats in these different environments, and some of the cats and rats controlled themselves, right, exploring the environment naturally. Other cats and rats were like in these little vehicles that a person would control, right, or a person would literally pick them up and take them from place to place. They found different cognitive outcomes, different mental outcomes, different social-emotional outcomes, right? Now, the extent to which these apply to human beings is certainly debatable, but at the least, it suggests that we too, as beings with bodies, need to actively engage with the physical world, frequently and with variety, to fulfill our capacities to flourish as we are designed to. We learn by expressing human agency in real environments, which helps us resist alienation and loneliness and nurtures cognitive development and mental health. Another area in the scientific world that's interesting, at least to consider, is the burgeoning field of embodied cognition. And again, it's, it's a bit controversial and direct applications to, with a Christian worldview we could certainly debate, but at the very least, embodied cognition suggests that the unique features of our physical bodies play a, play a central role in how we come to know and experience the world. So navigating the world with your particular body Okay, your height, your weight, your muscular build, your eyesight, your ears, your nose, your size feet, right? Even your male or female body, all of those things are central to what you know about the world and how you navigate the world, right? I mean, just think about that. If you're a tall person, you've got to watch out for door frames, don't you, right? Okay, that's just a, a reality of your specific body navigating the specific world, right? We could do many other examples. So this was what, we, what we'd call human embodiment, okay? sort of a philosophical or scientific principle to think about. Right? But now we want to couple that with biblical anthropology and a theology of the body. Okay? When we put the two together, you really end up with a pretty astounding picture of bodily life and how God works through tangible physical means. We are mind-body unities, brains and hearts united in one body. And that means our bodies are more important than we realize. Even cutting-edge artificial intelligence experts admit that their biggest puzzle is how the body is so central to human intelligence and learning, and how it's nearly impossible to recreate digitally or with a robot. As one such researcher has explained for years, quote, what distinguishes persons from machines is an involved, situated, material body. One of our great Lutheran theologians of our age, John Kleinig, elegantly unpacks all of this in his recent book, Wonderfully Made. He describes the body as theophanic, meaning that God made us so that he could give himself and his gifts bodily to people on earth and work with them in caring bodily for others and the world. Our human bodies do not just belong to this world, but also to the eternal world of God. Christ took on a human body to reclaim us bodily for fellowship with God the Father, as our bodies once again become what they were meant to be. 
He continues, God designed it so that he could show himself bodily to other embodied people and give them bodily access to himself by his theophany, his physical appearance to them in Jesus, end quote. This now leads us to consider more fully the nature of the church, where this Jesus is present for us. All right, so just tracking with me here with the outline, we looked at sort of the nature of the digital worldview, the problems with it, okay? Then we looked at the nature of the human person, problems with a mind-body dualism that's so evident today, the view of uh, human embodiment, and then a theology of the body. Now we're getting into the nature of the church, just to help you track with where we're at here. So our consideration of the nature of the church needs to begin by exploring the ways Christians tend to think about church or worship. The enveloping of digital technology around us has influenced us Christians too and tracks with the way technology contributes to a dualistic understanding of humans as thinking things or feeling things as we talked about earlier. For many Christians, Christianity remains mostly in their heads or in their hearts. For some, it is a series of intellectual ideas to which they give mental assent. For others, it's a series of emotional experiences which give them the right feelings about God. This is especially evident with the numerous Christians who view worship incorrectly as an act of man towards God. An intellectual act for God in our head or an emotional act for God in our hearts, where we learn the right facts about God and praise God, telling Him how worthy He is. When worship is mainly an intellectual activity, sacred space, ritual, art, architecture, and liturgy tend to dwindle as the sermon morphs from prophetic proclamation to lengthy lecture or TED talk. Preachers become professors, or self-help gurus, with congregants as students or followers, completing their intellectual work, while the sacraments are demoted to once a month or once a quarter. In his book, Disruptive Witness, Alan Noble explains that this intellectual approach to Christianity that's so common abroad the, the, excuse me, the denominational landscape today, that this view unintentionally communicates that the real point of church is to receive a lecture about the Bible that I can rationally apply to an area of my life to improve my standing before God. Noble calls this excarnational worship. Great phrase, excarnational worship, which makes communion with God a thing that happens inside our heads, not with our whole selves, including our bodies. Noble then continues, If the purpose of church is just to learn about God the way we learn about any other subject, we shouldn't be surprised when people stop showing up to church once they feel they've learned everything. The weekly gathering together of saints is only justified if attending church is about much more than intellectual growth. In this sense, excarnation is not only a deviation from historical Christianity, it renders regular church attendance obsolete. Now, Noble wrote that before COVID, by the way. Correspondingly, when worship is viewed primarily as an internal emotional activity for God, as something that takes place inside our hearts in the interior self, we see the elevation of experience and feelings Evidence in things like praise and worship sessions focused on the subjective eye, the Jesus makes you happy slash makes your life better messaging, and in the what this means to me approach to the Bible. Doctrine, theology, and preaching decline as praise and worship take on near sacramental status. Worship leaders become the new priesthood, presiding not over the Lord's table, but presiding over the process as congregants complete their emotional work subjectively, while the sermon joins the actual actual sacraments in the shadows. Noble captures what's at stake in the emotional trajectory too. He says this, The result is that we experience worship much like we experience a concert. It becomes an individual emotional and spiritual exercise where I try my best to think about the words and praise God. 
But even though I am surrounded by others, surrounded by the saints, I remain comfortably in my own head. If our worship remains an individual spiritual exercise, we will contribute to the secular trend of reducing the spiritual to the private. So in both the thinking and the feeling trajectories, Christianity becomes chiefly about our emotional or intellectual acts for God. Now, in the digital age, further questions surface. If worship is an internal act of my emotions or heart or my intellect or mind, why bother coming to church when online sermons and downloadable songs enable that work to be done anywhere? And with better musicians and preachers to boot. In this setting, church becomes just another content provider. The church as streaming service. The church as my content provider. I remain in control of it all. From which preacher to listen to. Which songs to sing along with. All the way down to the volume of the sound. The brightness of the screen. The playback speed. The size of the image. And... I can turn it on or off at will. Online worship further magnifies the dualistic tendencies of modern worship and the feeling of personal control. If worship is just an internal work of feeling the Spirit or thinking for Jesus, reasons for attending in person dwindle. Church growth guru Kerry Neuenhoff admits just this, quote, Increasingly, I'm convinced there's no point to merely attending. You drive all the way in to connect with three or four songs, hear the message, and then head home. All of that you could do by yourself in a much more convenient way. Slip on Spotify, grab the message via via podcast or on demand, and boom, you're covered. This is the conundrum we face when we misunderstand the human person as dualistic or misunderstand worship as something that resolves, revolves around doing something for God individually via the thoughts in my head or the feelings in my heart. No wonder Christianity gets cordoned off in our private thoughts or gets subjectivized into oblivion and emotional feelings and reflects the world's understanding of identity and happiness. In such a setting, Christianity itself easily becomes just another identity category among many that make up my true self. Alan Noble again, helpful here, he says this, quote, I may try on Christianity like I try on styles of clothes or beliefs, but the ultimate focus is not on an external being who loves me, but my own search for fullness. He further notes, our identity And our ability to choose its features becomes the basis for our being in the world, rather than some outside authority. So that even when we believe in God's existence and choose to follow Him, we do so because of an inner decision. Online worship is in some ways a logical outworking of mind-body dualism and constructed identity where I can choose to try on Christianity in the style or format I desire and do so in a Gnostic, disembodied fashion with no real connection to people or place required. Now, can one learn something from listening to a sermon online? Can one be edified and encouraged by watching others gathered in worship, singing hymns and singing along? Yes. And thanks be to God for it in extenuating circumstances or certain homebound scenarios. But let's be clear, it's not actual Christian worship that the person behind the screen is engaging in. It's observing others engaged in Christian worship and getting a second-order benefit from it. Thus, we should avoid misleading phrases like online church or online worship. Neither are accurate or helpful. We must not confuse virtual presence with real presence or communicate through our practices of using digital technology, that it is the same thing. It may be a supplement in specific situations and scenarios, but it cannot be regarded as a general substitute. We must make sure that our uses of digital technology are not unintentionally undercutting the very message of Christ made flesh, Christ crucified, Christ risen 
from the dead. God gives himself to us in worship through objective and clear means. For me, as one who came into Lutheranism through a roundabout process through many denominations 17 years ago now, this was one of the most persuasive and enchanting aspects of Lutheranism. You have a treasure. Christianity now coming into Lutheranism was not just something that made sense in my head or felt right in my heart. It was made real, bodily. Christianity was a given identity, gifted by God through the means of grace, not a chosen identity of my will or my mind or my heart or my head. Doctrine and practice were unified, communicating the same message to the whole person and in person. But even more, these objective gifts become subjectively ours as Christ, who came from outside of us to become one of us, is then spoken and sacramented to us. We need to treasure and retain this rich mystery of God's work through word and sacrament as it re-enchants the world from being just a glob of material stuff to being a cosmic dance. But the very things that make this reality real in our lives have been vacated in contemporary life and contemporary church. We have demystified much of the world through scientism, materialism, and our technological prowess over nature and humankind. And we've demystified the church by diminishing the centrality of the sacred and sacramental and bringing the technological tools of the world right into the church, making the church seem just like the world. For Christianity to be in its rightful place as deepest reality, it has to be situated in the context of rich, thick practices and habits and be made physical and tangible. It has to be anchored to sacramental practice and liturgical rhythm. Let's unpack how this actually occurs through having a more historically faithful understanding of worship as Gottesdienst. The Lutheran Reformers' preferred term for worship was Gottesdienst, meaning God's work or divine service. As Timothy Wengert explains, quote, Luther's concept of the basic structure for how God and humanity relate was clear. God is the active partner, the individual, the passive one. Worship is above all else the gathering of the community in which God serves the assembled people, end quote. This completely inverts the worship paradigm of modern American Christianity and rightly places God as the main giver and humanity as the main receiver. This was also clear in the Latin phrase, servitum dei, as it was even more in the ancient Greek term, liturgia, meaning public service or work for the people. In New Testament times, the word commonly referred to fulfilling public offices at one's own cost. These were acts of public service done by a patron or a benefactor for the good of the community. It was the work of a greater for the good of the lesser. When applied to worship, then, liturgia provides a beautiful picture of God as the benefactor who does his work, giving good gifts to the congregation. John Francis Baldwin explains that, quote, in its origins, liturgia referred not to the work done by the people, but rather a public work, a benefaction or work done for the people. These Greek, Latin, and German terms restore life into the world of Christian worship and bring worship beyond the realm of inner feelings or thoughts for God in curvatus in se into the objective realities of pure gifts from God, extra nos. It is in these pure gifts that the objective and subjective are united beautifully. What is objectively true and real and deepest reality is applied individually to each person in their actual embodied soul. This paradigm shift revolutionizes how one views the work of the church and the reasons for going to church. Worship then is primarily holistic reception of God's salvific acts in time and space for us. Reception of the spoken and sacramental word. 
This cannot be fully replicated online or while alone. Here's why. Online worship clouds the sacramentality of absolution and preaching. And perhaps might our dabbling in online worship reveal a weak understanding of word and language as merely information or information exchange rather than means of grace central to reality itself? Who is the pastor absolving in the pronouncement of I forgive you when it's spliced together from video clips recorded ahead of time? or watched later, or even streamed and watched in different locations? How does the pastor know who he's talking to? How does the viewer know who the pastor's referring to? The sure word of absolution becomes muddied in the invisible ether of the internet. So to the reality of preaching in persona Christi is clouded in the digital medium. How is one submitting to the authority of the self-authenticating word or to a local church when one can choose from endless preachers? Who is the pastor addressing? The direct encounter with the preached God is emasculated. The risk, the discomfort, the friction and tension of human-to-human interaction and God-to-human confrontation are smoothed over with the elegant allure of the frictionless screen. The arresting power of the accusations of the law against you and the liberating power of the comforts of the gospel for you are lost in the anonymity of the screen. The acts of divine self-giving through the performative word of preaching and absolution does what it says. Christ's word does not describe reality. It determines reality. The preacher's direct delivery of this Christic word gets jumbled by its mediations through wires, pixels, and screens. Congregants' existential encounter with the word is weakened. The pastor cannot look at you. You cannot look at him. The unified focus of the gathered ones is splintered by each screen behind which each viewer sits. I remain alone, isolated, in my own head or heart, firmly in control. Then we come to baptism and Eucharist, which are by their very nature impossible in the online environment. The pastor administering either rite has no direct physical contact with the person to which the rite is supposedly being applied, and the person is not in the physical presence of the one administering the rite. This just scratches the surface of the problems in attempting to do the sacraments online. Pastors and theologians in your own church body and in the LCMS and other confessional Lutheran church bodies have published clear papers over the last few years addressing the novelty of online communion. I will not rehash their arguments, uh, their arguments here. You have one right, right in your room here, Pastor David Weber, who has a wonderful paper on this written in 2020. Jordan Cooper wrote a paper in 2021. There's many resources that address the specific issue of online communion. Um, and I'd refer you to those to get all the, the practical, theological, biblical, confessional um, issues with, with that idea. So let's explore some other motifs that I think help fill out the picture, right? We could talk about, pre- um, you know, preaching, absolution, uh, baptism, Eucharist, the, the sacramentality of all those things is at least obscured, let's say, right? Clouded in the online medium, okay? Um, but let's fill out the picture with some other motifs in the Bible that I think help ground our practice of the divine service and give us some guidance for how to approach using digital technologies in the ministry of the church. So some further exploration. I think one of the uh, biggest motifs that can give additional depth and richness to this reality of God's work through word and sacrament is the theme of temple, presence, and place throughout the Bible. The Old Testament is replete with the redeeming presence of God associated with places. Jacob's exclamation after his dream of the angel of the Lord descending the staircase was, surely God is in this place. The tradition of building altars and renaming places to mark God's work there. Consider also the tabernacle and the temple where God chose to make his name dwell. That is, his presence. Now, God certainly is present everywhere, 
but he still promises to be present in a special redeeming way in physical means that require physical presence in a physical place, which is usually the local church from where the means of grace are distributed. Heaven is breaking in in those moments, seeping into our world, and that takes place, again, primarily in the divine service. As these interpenetrating realities of space and time, heaven and earth, mind and matter, all converge and unite around Christ the Logos, who is made manifest in word and sacrament. In online church, where and how does this take place? Is it in the viewer's hearts or heads? Is the place in the computer's hard drive? Is it in the wireless internet signal? It's no place. There's nothing to anchor to or hold on to. Even the eschatological kingdom, the new Jerusalem, is a place with a feast where we will gather with our bodies. Another theme that I think uh, is interesting to think about in the New Testament is the theme of koinonia, right? Communion or table fellowship. Christian fellowship is not simply friendship or camaraderie, nor is it potlucks and game nights. Fellowship takes place around the table of the Lord in a unified confession, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, not around all-purpose tables partaking of Aunt Betty's green jello salad. Fellowship is actually a manifestation of the eschatological kingdom, which is a foretaste of the feast to come. As such, fellowship is at its core participation in and union with Christ and unity with one another around his teaching. This is the thrust of much of Koinonia's New Testament usage, which culminates in Paul's use of Koinonia in 1 Corinthians 10.16, where it refers to participation in the blood of Christ and in the body of Christ. Attempting to worship online communicates something very different than Koinonia. It communicates that I don't need to be known here, that I can worship without being known by God or by my fellow man. The possibilities of a shared common life together and the communal sharing of burdens are also diminished. In real worship, we are known by God and by one another. Christians find their deepest identity around the table of the Lord, in a unified confession and in communion, koinonia, with Christ himself and those who partake of the same body. Individual and communal identity find their nexus in the sacramental eating of Christ, which is an identification not only with Christ, but also with his living body, the church. By means of this real mystical union with Christ, begun in baptism, continued in Eucharist, our identity is firmly planted in a sacramental culture, liturgical tradition, and embodied community. Another theme, suffering. The centrality of suffering and its embodiment in the lives of Christ's people is muddied by digital and online mechanisms. Consider Colossians 1.24, where Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Of course, nothing lacks in Christ's work of salvation. It's complete and full. But communicating that salvific work to the world frequently calls forth an embodiment of Christ's sufferings in the lives of Christians. This requires presence. As Christians not only take up Christ's name or ideas, they take up his cross. Another theme, the marital image, spousal, nuptial imagery, right, of Christ and his bride. This also informs our critique or concerns about online worship. Christ the bridegroom gives himself to his bride, the church, and the bride receives the life-giving act. Acts of divine self-giving are intimate, deeply real, and fully embodied. Body inside of body, blood commingling with blood. Christ's active word creates reality and does what it says to us, in us, through us. 
divine self-giving through Christ's speech acts is rich and worth much further reflection. Another theme, mysterion and kairos, both. Two Greek terms in the New Testament used many times. Mysterion, translated sacramentum in Latin, used 27 times in the New Testament, refers to the mystery of the incarnation and the sacramental realities through which divine self-giving occurs. Right? So when we see new, mis, mystery in the New Testament, we're not talking like about a detective story right? or a secret or some revelatory knowledge that just you know, the, the enlightened people have, right? not like a Gnostic revelation. It's something that's revealed right? in time, in Christ, that the angels longed to look into before. Right? So when we hear mystery, we don't want to think of like you know, Agatha Christie. Right? We want to think of something that's so awe-inspiring that all we can do is cover our mouths in awe. That's what the mysterion in Greek, the, the root, comes from, to shut the mouth or to cover the mouth. Mysterion, 27 times in the New Testament, usually referring to this incarnational sacramental reality. Okay? Kairos, frequently used in the New Testament, usually in a way different from another Greek word for time, chronos. Right? So you have, two, you have many words for time in Greek, but two main ones that sort of are juxtapo- uh, juxtaposed opposite each other, kairos and chronos. Right? The kairos approach to time is the fullness of time that was mentioned earlier this morning by Dr. Schultz. Right? The redemptive story of time, purposeful time, not linear time. That's chronos, right? chronological time. Divine service ushers us into the domain of kairos, the redemptive reality of time, sacred time. Not the Kronos time of social media feeds, timelines, and video timestamps. There are many other themes we could explore there, but I think those are major ones. If we're going to have a full-orbed theology of worship and of the church, those are some of the themes we need to think of. Uh, the marital imagery, right? Mystery, Kairos, um, and then the one I had before that was Koinonia and uh, temple, temple pl- presence in place, right? Okay, so what do we do with all this? Can digital technology be an outreach tool? Can it be a godsend for homebound members? A way to, for someone to sort of dip their toes in the water a bit? A supplement for education or edification? Yes, perhaps if done carefully. But there's also significant unintended consequences that come with it, and many more that I think will come into view in the coming years. In streaming our services, are we really reaching more new people, or are we enabling delinquency? Is it really musical chairs for churches? Is it connected to the larger philosophical movements of the self and identity that we've discussed in this conference, or is it related to problematic ideas about humanity, dualism, and even language? It also needs to be said that this new innovation called online worship has not really arisen from any grand new theological insight or principle within our confessional tradition. But it's more been brought in from other realms of society where these things have become more common. These are going to be difficult questions to consider. Again, each one needs to be looked at carefully. They're going to require our continued attention and working together, mutual assistance in navigating the years to come. But hopefully the principles we've laid out here regarding the nature of the human person and the nature of the church can be guideposts along the way. And those further areas of exploration can uh, fill out our understanding of the nature of the church and the nature of worship. So a rich theology of the body and of Christ's body is vital today and quite compelling and intriguing in an increasingly digitized age. Christianity's celebration of the goodness and the givenness of the human body and its remaking in Christ offers a coming to the real true and deepest reality, the story of stories, mystery and enchantment, all centered on the mystery hidden for ages, but now revealed to his saints. That is, the mystery of God made man, still coming to man through word and sacrament. So too, a robust theology of the church and its sacramental and liturgical practices fills out the picture. Church is not just a place to sing, listen, think, or emote. It is Gottesdienst. Liturgia, 
servitum dei, where God is there giving, serving, forgiving. In normal situations, online worship might work at cross purposes to this reality and does run dangerously close to the mind-body dualism that is at odds with Christianity's holistic view of the human person situated in local communities. This is the church's confession, that in the word proclaimed and in the Eucharist celebrated, Christ gives himself in his very person for you. Both human embodiment and the sacramental nature of the church draw us towards the assembly and gathering as the one body where we receive the Christ. There is a place for Christian education and edification through digital media, podcasts, online classes, articles, prayer groups, Bible teaching, conferences made available online like this one. But Gottesdienst, Christian worship, and the celebration of the Eucharist cannot be fully duplicated online. And thus, I suggest, should retain the pristine physicality and simplicity that makes it as relevant and possible in the first century as in the 21st century, as low-tech and embodied as possible, untouched by what Byung-Chul Han calls the digital dismantling of the real, unencumbered by cords, wires, cameras, and microphones, uninterrupted by flashing screens, notification dings, or PowerPoint presentations, unmediated by the technological layers enveloping us in everyday life, In such a place, our human finitude encounters divine life through water, word, bread, and wine, through sacred space and sacred song, heavenly art and soaring architecture. In such a place, we are steered away from digital evanescence and restored into the realm of the real, both transcendent and physical. In such a place, God meets man, no screen or app required. If we ever have any doubts about the importance of our bodies and our bodily presence in worship and the acts of divine self-giving through Christ's direct speech and act, let us remember that the God of the universe has taken on flesh, not just temporarily, but permanently. Christ will always have his body. And not only that, the glorified, glorious body of God the Son that will be worshipped in all eternity is a wounded body. In the words of Charles Wesley's hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, we read, Every eye shall now behold him, robed in glorious majesty. Those who set at naught and sold him pierced and nailed him to the tree. Deeply wailing, deeply wailing, shall their true Messiah see. Those dear tokens of his passion, still his dazzling body bears, cause of endless exultation to his ransomed worshipers. With what rapture, with what rapture, gaze we on those glorious scars. Yea, amen, let all adore thee, high on thine eternal throne. Savior, take the power and glory, claim the kingdom as thine own. Alleluia, alleluia, thou shalt reign, and thou alone. Christ, the Word made flesh, the one who is preeminent over all things, has wounds in his hands and in his feet, and in his side. And that is what makes his body most glorious, dazzling, as Wesley put it. The perfected, glorified human body is the wounded body of the Christ. All of creation will bow before a body with wounds. Christ has taken into his actual body all of the evil, suffering, and sin of each of us and the whole world. And his bodily resurrection from the dead in real history guarantees that what he bore fully in his very body, soul, mind, and heart was for us. And not only that, that very body, incarnate, died, buried, raised, 
is united with our bodies as he puts his actual body intimately into ours in a mysterious and mystical union through word and sacrament in the divine service. And so we honor, celebrate, and bow before the suffering God and his cross, and we too bear in our own bodies an extension of Christ's sufferings, which heralds Christ's name to the world. Christ still bears in his body the marks of salvation, marks that are the result of God's physical entanglement with our sorry lot. Christ touches. With his hands, he heals the sick, opens mouths, unstops ears, unveils eyes, blesses the children, and raises the dead. And ultimately, it is the marks in Christ's hands that fully and definitively reveal his true identity in his post-resurrection appearance to Thomas. Christ himself, the enfleshed God, invites Thomas to put his hands into the hands that made the world and saved the world. Put your finger here and see my hands, Christ says, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Then Thomas responds with what is only fitting for one who has just touched the very wounds of God. My Lord and my God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then after that we'll have a 20-minute break, and then we'll bring all three speakers up for a panel with extended Q&A. So are there uh, perhaps about three questions now before our break? I like going to church. Just like I, I prefer being with my wife rather than phoning her. It's different. But I think it's good to not place limitations on God that he doesn't place on himself. I have a different kind of story. I come from Oregon. Almost nobody goes to church in Oregon. I was in college at the University of Oregon before um, I heard what a Christian was. Had no idea. Um, but a, a friend I met um, in college, uh, a black man who had converted to Catholicism a year earlier from Salt Lake City, there's likely only one of those, <laughs> told me I should read the Bible. And I, my response was, you're kidding me, people still do that? And he looked at me kind of horrified. Um, about the time that I started reading the Bible a year later, um, he was being murdered in a gay bar. And I never got to talk with him again. I don't know why he was there, and I, maybe I'll find out later. But I read the Bible probably to try to disprove it or something. And I remember later a friend named Jeff talking to me and saying, are you a Christian? And I said, as a good Oregonian, I don't know, what is that? And he explained, somebody who trusts in Christ for his salvation, that he, that he died for us and rose for us and that he is our hope. And I said, huh, isn't that strange? I guess I'm a Christian. By reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit working through the Word of Gospel, Romans 10, 17 and other places, I had become a believer. I wasn't attending church anywhere. A church had nothing to do with my conversion. Nobody from a church talking to me had anything to do with my conversion. Nobody shared the gospel with me. I just read the word and believed. And so even though going to church is a good thing, and I hardly recommend it as a pastor, that would be consistent. I think it's important not to place limitations on what, what God can do. Yeah, point, point taken. I, I wouldn't disagree with anything you said. Um, 
and I wouldn't say that, uh, that we shouldn't use digital technology to do precisely the type of thing you said, education, edification, outreach, right? I do think there's something categorically different about Gottesdienst that can't be fully replicated online. Um, so that's really the thrust of my argument, is that Gottesdienst is categorically different. Um, so yeah, you, and you were connecting to the Bible itself, right? W reading it. Uh, and there are many great resources online, right? I mean, books, we, we could go on it. Tape, tape recordings, CDs, DVDs, right? I mean, there's all sorts of ways that, uh, that God uses means, right? Um, but the, the, there's also, like you said, unless God has placed limitations on himself, right? What has he chained himself to? Where do we know he has promised to be? Uh, in, in the word and sacraments, right? So, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm not saying that there's no place for digital technology. I'm saying that we need to be more careful when it comes to Gottesdienst and digital technology. So, so thank, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. This is uh, extremely edifying and helpful. Uh, and, you know, thinking of these uh, resources online, church services that are streamed and whatnot, my family has made use of those in times of illness when we couldn't make it to, to church, and it's a, a great devotional resource in that way. But uh, as we're uh, in this conference, we're recognizing some of the importance of language, and you brought up that talking about online worship and online church is misleading. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can help me out and uh, uh, find some, some terms that would be helpful to refer to these things. Great, with. great, thank you. Yeah, we'll do a little bit more practical here. Um, so yeah, the, the framework I'm providing, I'm hoping is giving you some, some guideposts to apply to specific scenarios, right? And that's why I said at the beginning, we could come up with a bajillion what ifs, right? But bad cases don't make for good law, right? So I wanted to establish some framework, uh, sort of a theological framework to, for thinking about these things that then hopefully can help you do the pastoral care that's required to apply these to specific scenarios, right? So one thing, yeah, I would not call it online worship or online uh, church. And that would mean also that maybe we change what we're recording, right? Maybe we just don't stream the whole thing, right? Um, personally, um, I'd suggest not recording com communion. I think that's too confusing. Um, service of the word, right? Uh, service as a sacrament, I think that's, this is my opinion, right? And you're, you're free to disagree. Um, but recording the service of the sacrament and providing that, I, I just don't really see what, what people are gaining because that's an embodied reality that God has connected himself to that requires you to be there, right? Um, the, the listening to a sermon, right? The edification side, the education side, yeah, that, I, I don't have a problem with that. So I think that's one way to make the break. Uh, what we've done at our church, um, I'll show you here a little video intro we've done to all of our online resources. We've put a one-minute video intro to all of them, uh, trying to nuance this a little bit and trying to, to provide some clarity for what people are getting and not getting online. Um, so there'd be different ways to do this. Before COVID, we were only providing the, ser the, the sermon, and, and we, we've refused to stream. We'd record it and post it later. And again, that's, that's my opinion and something our elder board and pastors have agreed with. We don't want to give the impression that this is a direct replacement, um, so we don't stream it. Because that, that gives the impression, at least. It could give the impression, right? You've got to think about what is it communicating, right? Even unintentionally. What theology is being communicated by the practices we're doing, right? That's, I think, the driving underlying point that we need to think most about. Um, so yeah, I, we didn't do the sermon. Once uh, COVID started, we, we did provide the service up until the sacrament. We provided the service of the word, okay? Uh, but we still don't provide the, the recording of, of the sacrament. Um, so here, here's the video that we've put in at the beginning of all of our online resources. Thank you to Kurt for, for queuing this up here. Let's see if this will work. All Saints Lutheran Church is a ministry of word and sacrament. We believe, teach, and confess that Jesus Christ descends to us and is truly present with us and for us in the divine service where he delivers his good gifts to us through the tangible, physical means of word and water, bread and wine. Communion with God involves our whole selves, including our bodies, in participation with one another and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It was not meant to happen inside our heads, isolated in front of a computer screen. We're glad to offer you these video recordings and online resources to enable you to hear the word. But this can never be a replacement or substitute for the in-person divine service. While extenuating circumstances may justify temporary separation, we look forward to the day when we can receive Christ's gifts together in the divine service. So it's not perfect. It's not the greatest quality. That's one minute, okay? And you probably heard some of the phrases that I used in there. Basically, I created a... uh, a narration that was too long and the elders chopped it up and pastor fixed it and that's our pastor's voice there so basically that's what's at the beginning of every video we post on youtube is that and then it's just a service of the word is that the best solution i don't know uh it, and our elder board wasn't in in total agreement uh, i was actually outnumbered i wanted to go back to just doing the sermon um but that's fine you know so i'm not saying that i have all the answers but i do think we need to be thinking theologically about what we're communicating and the, the straight use of online worship or online church or straight streaming, I think, is more likely to be confusing. Maybe I'll say that, okay? That it's more likely to be confusing. Thank okay. you. And, and again, to reiterate that point, we don't always have all the answers, and yet do we have the formula to start asking the right questions and to work together as a body of Christ to seek those answers together and to correct ourselves when we go astray? Let us continue with those thoughts in about 20 minutes during our extended Q&A period. And so please uh, stay for that. We'll see you shortly. Thank you again, Joshua Pauling.